Coming up on one minute. Mark, T-minus 60 seconds and counting. We are go for Apollo 7 at this time. Joseph is a scholar. Uh, he needs no introduction, I know, with this audience, but his work has had a profound impact on me and many of the people who will be speaking this weekend. Um, he makes us think. He stretches our not only our knowledge of history and our knowledge of the world and cosmology, um, but he stretches the creativity that we apply, and it's always a pleasure. He's going to be talking today, Cosmic War, Cosmic Versailles, Historical and Mythological Perspectives on the Origin of Secret Space Programs and Their Policy Formation Culture. So always unbelievably juicy. With no further ado, Dr. Joseph Farrell. All right, can everybody hear me? Good, bad? All right, good. Let's get started. There we are. All right. Let me get the commercial out of the way. Yaron asked me to speak about my Cosmic War Versailles template thesis. So you've been, if you've been reading the books, you've been familiar with some of it. These are all the books I'm going to be drawing some of my comments today from. And uh, my thesis is that we're all creatures of our history. And this applies especially to the national security establishment in the United States of America after World War II. And especially with regard to the UFO problem. And as we're going to see in this talk, many of the men in the national security establishment after World War II had much of their worldview formed not so much just in World War II or by the Cold War, but actually by World War I. And last year I suggested at the Secret Space Program conference that, in fact, if you look at what's going on after World War II and with the establishment of what we are essentially calling a secret space program, a breakaway civilization, that these men would have formulated their policies on the basis of their experience to avoid a Tower of Babel moment of history and a repetition of things that may have happened in the distant past. And in that respect, I also suggested that they would go back and look at ancient texts to see if there was any guidance, if there was something in those texts that might be possible to formulate their policies from. And in this respect, the parallels between World War I and what I'm calling the Cosmic Versailles are truly astonishing. So my thesis is that the post-Cosmic War period, I believe that there was an ancient Cosmic War fought right here in our solar system. And that this may have created a Versailles Treaty situation. And that's what we're going to be examining today. So we're, we've already looked back at San Mateo. This is what we're going to be talking about today. This is a two-part presentation. We're going to talk about the historical context, and we're going to talk about lots of artillery, since we're talking about World War I. We're going to talk about the mythological context, where we're going to be talking about lots of psychopathy. And then finally, we're going to be talking about the implications for the national security breakaway civilization complex, where we're going to talk about lots of paranoia. So now this is crucial. This is absolutely crucial because, again, as we're going to see at the very end of this talk, all of these things are in play with some of the biggest names that you're probably already familiar with in the national security establishment. As I indicated last year, there was a threefold strategic threat that the post World War II national security establishment was facing communists, the post war Nazis, and of course, UFOs. And as I suggested last year, this would have forced them to create a Manhattan Project on steroids lasting several decades but with the immediate need 
to develop technologies, reconnaissance technologies, potentially able to scout out and find out what the Soviet bloc was up to, find out where the Nazis were and what they were up to. That's a big part of my work. And then finally, not only to do this, but secondly to, to introduce a program designed to deal with the problem posed by UFOs and to institute a long-range Black Projects technological research program to emulate the performance characteristics of UFOs, if possible, and achieve parity or near parity. And you're going to be hearing, I'm quite certain, from Dr. Paul Violette, one of my favorite researchers in this field, about some of these technologies. Now, this implies that the national security establishment had concluded, as they're trying to achieve parity, that UFOs, as I indicated last year, posed a potential national security threat because much UFO activity was concentrated over American and Soviet defense installations. And if you recall my presentation from last year, I indicated at a Soviet nuclear ICBM base in the Ukraine, at Bielokorovitsya in the Ukraine, UFOs actually activated the launch sequence of Soviet ICBMs leaving Soviet crews scrambling to shut this down and prevent a thermonuclear war. So we're continuing kind of my review because my, I want you to view my remarks today in the context of what we said last year. This is my revision and extension of remarks. And in this respect, last year I suggested that there's another thing that the national security establishment inevitably is going to undertake. They're going to try and undertake a study of ancient religious mythological text and lore for the purposes of seeing if they could determine who was behind the UFOs and secondly, if possible, where they were from, thirdly, what they wanted, and fourthly, what their motivations were. Were they hostile? Well, certainly with all the activity over American defense installations, Soviet defense installations, interfering with both American and Soviet and presumably French and British nuclear weapons systems, that this was at least a provocative act and hence they had the need to develop these black projects to achieve some sort of technological parity or near parity with the performance characteristics of UFOs. And if that's the case, then they also had the need to determine if psychological warfare operations could be mounted against them. What policies might be indicated by these ancient texts and their contexts. Now, it's that last question that, in my opinion, brings us to the idea that we might be dealing with a cosmic Versailles if, in fact, a cosmic war had been fought in the distant past of high antiquity right here in our solar system. And consider the importance of this. Because if there's a cosmic Versailles, if there's some treaty that you might be able to find traces of in ancient texts, in ancient lore, then they need to know the terms of that treaty. Is it still in effect? What happens if it's violated? And I think once you get into seeing what I'm about to present in this talk, you're going to see that this was very much possibly a part of their thinking. So their goal is to prevent a second interference, a second Tower of Babel moment of human history. Now, one last comment about my presentations last year. I argued that the appearance of UFOs in great numbers at the beginning of the human nuclear and thermonuclear era was possibly because the nuclear bomb, per the observations of the Nazi scientist working for Juan Perón in Argentina, Dr. Ronald Richter, you recall that I mentioned that Dr. Ronald Richter said that plasmas under electromagnetic stress, and what's a nuclear bomb? Well, it's a nuclear plasma under electromagnetic stress, 
might possibly be gating energy in from the configuration of local space-time, that is to say, from the positions of the planets and so on, and when and where on the surface of the Earth the bomb is set off. So in other words, for a brief moment, it functions as a gateway, as a transducer of the zero-point energy as it's configured in local space. Therefore, summing all this together, if you're that national security establishment, and if you're political, geopolitical, strategic, cultural views have been formed not only in the emerging crucible of the Cold War, but much more importantly, as we're going to see with some very famous examples, in the crucible of World War I, which stop and think about it, folks, right now, at this very moment, 100 years ago, we were in the middle of World War I. And many of the men that formulated these policies went through that and were part of the policy formation culture of the then existing national security establishment in the United States and the other Western allies. So, this brings me to the thesis. I've suggested in many interviews that there's a direct analogy between the post-World War I settlement, between the Allied and Associated Powers on the one hand, and the Central Powers on the other, and that ancient cosmic war that I believe to have been fought by the gods within our own solar system. But I've left my detailed reasons for thinking this largely unstated, so you're going to hear them here for the first time. So let me state them clearly and unequivocally by way of a history lesson and lots of artillery. About 100 years and a few months ago, this rather dour-looking man, uh, Field Marshal August von Mackensen was his name, in the month of April of 1915, launched what was supposed to have been a limited offensive in Tarnov Gorlitsia in Galicia to help relieve the Russian pressure on Germany's Austro-Hungarian allies. But what happened was that his offensive was so successful and so brutal that the Russian lines began to collapse to the point that Germany decided to go on a front-wide offensive in 1915. It nearly led, in 1915, to the complete collapse and exit of Russia from the war. That's how close this came. So if you can imagine that four-year-long slaughter that was World War I, shortened to two years, Russia taken out of the war, all of that massive military machine that Austria and Germany fielded, then sent westward to deal with the Western Allies. What made it possible was this man here. I told you we're going to talk about lots of artillery. What made it possible was this man here. This is Lieutenant Colonel Georg Bruchmiller. And we all know the stories, we've all seen the films, we've all read the history books of how on the Western Front the Allies and Germans just bombarded each other for weeks on end with artillery to create breakthroughs, supposedly, in the trench system, trench warfare system that held on the Western Front. This man changed the tactics completely on the Eastern Front. He believed in sudden, massive, coordinated artillery, infantry, cavalry movements with timetables. I won't go in, into the details, but by 1918, these tactics were then applied on the final German offensives in March of 19, beginning with the so-called Kaiserschlacht, the first offensive, German offensive in March of 1918, after the Russians surrendered to the Central Powers. On such a narrow front, this man concentrated over 6,000 tubes, 6,000 artillery tubes, on a front of about 25 miles against the British lines. And in a five-hour bombardment, hurled more ordnance on British lines than we dropped on Nazi Germany in all of World War II, in five hours. And of course, the British were sent 
reeling. Okay? The roar was so bad from that intense five-hour bombardment, it could be heard 60 miles away in Paris. It could be heard, if you listened carefully, even in London. That's how bad it was. Now, why am I emphasizing all of this military pornography? It's because when we get to Versailles, something happens. And it's precisely these six points that indicate to me that there may have been a cosmic Versailles in place at the end of that cosmic war in distant mists of high antiquity. The six crucial points are these. Number one, the family feud that was World War I was over. For consider, Kaiser Wilhelm II was the cousin of King George of the United Kingdom. He was the cousin via family relationships and marriage to Tsar Nicholas II. The second point is, watch this one, the second point is, Versailles, of course, you'll recall, stipulated massive war reparations. Germany had to pay massive war rep reparations to the Allies. And I want you to think of this in terms, borrowing the insights of, of Secretary Fitz, I want you to think of this in terms of a tithe or of the ancient practice of tribute to a conquering king and so massive were the reparations on the Germans that what you're really doing is you're harvesting their national wealth and productivity of each and every last living individual German. So in a certain sense, it's even sacrifice. The third thing I want you to pay attention to is what did the Allied and Associated Powers do? Well, first of all, they took an inventory. They've just suffered four years of war, and then in the final year of the war, these massive German offensives with numbers of artillery that boggle the mind of all calibers from the very small up, up to the very large. So the first thing the Allies do is they inventory the German war machine and stipulate in the disarmament clauses of the treaty that the German Reich would be prohibited from the manufacture of certain types of weapons. And if you stop and think about this, if you've read my book, The Cosmic War, I put in that book the entire epic of Ninurta, an ancient Mesopotamian text, and I did that for a very specific reason. Because when you read this text, it's hardly an epic. It's like reading the index of the Sears catalog. It's simply an inventory. And most interestingly, this is an epic about actions being taken after a war of the gods. And the inventory is an inventory of the weapons that were used to fight this war. And some of that technology was taken by the victors and used and applied in other contexts. Some of the technology was destroyed and a very small category of that technology that could not be destroyed was hidden. Fourthly, as a part of the stipulation of, and provisions of the treaty, the Versailles system set up a system of monitoring to ensure German compliance with the treaty. In other words, you don't rely on the enemy that you just defeated to tell you, oh no, we're not building any of that. Mm -mm. You set up a system of monitoring and this has both a public and a secret aspect because the French, of course, insisted in the treaty that they be able to send their attaches and representatives to all the German heavy industry plants and inspect them to make sure that the Germans weren't producing any heavy armaments that they had just had the bitter experience of facing. But this also means 
that they set up a system of spies. And I want you to file that one in the back of your mind because that's going to be a very crucial point. The fifth thing they did was they set up a quarantine zone around Germany and insisted, and this is one of the quarantine zones, this is the Rhineland, and this is actually a German map that shows you this is what was demilitarized, entmilitarisiert, uh, ent this is the demilitarized zone in the Rhineland. And that extended, as you can see, to a zone of about 30 kilometers on the east bank of the Rhine with allied bridgeheads around the cities of Köln, Mainz, and so on. So that whole area was demilitarized. It was a quarantine zone. They were trying to confine any potential German military action to a jumping off position behind the Rhine River, should it ever happen. So they set up a quarantine zone, incidentally another one around eastern, the eastern part of Germany in a rather different way. And I want you to file that one in the back of your mind. And then finally, the most significant point World War I was really sort of Act I, as we know, in a great world war that the world fought from 1914 to 1945. And World War I ended more or less as a stalemate. Everybody's exhausted, we want to go home, we're tired of fighting, let's call it quits. Now, if the national security establishment is formed in this crucible, this is the way they're going to look at things. They're going to look at recent human history, World War I, World War II, and apply this Versailles template to the reading of ancient texts and ancient mythology. So let's look close, more closely at this. What was World War I? Well, as I've indicated, it's basically a family feud. The Hohenzollerns are related to the Habsburgs, are related to the Windsors, also known as Sachsa, Coburg und Gotha, are related to the Romanovs, are related to the House of Savoy in Italy. It's a big family feud. Interestingly enough, when you go back and look at the ancient Mesopotamian texts in particular, that refer to this cosmic war, what you see is a war fought among the gods, which if you look at the gods, they're all related to each other. So it's a big family feud. It's a big civil war. Enki, Tiamat, Nergal, Mars, incidentally, Ninurta, these are all related to each other by dint of their descent from the supreme god An. And the Greeks have their versions of this, the Romans have their versions of this, the Aztecs have their versions of this, the Vedas have their versions of this, the Bible, Lucifer, Michael, the war in heaven. Everybody has a version of this cosmic war. So now, look at something else. In the Versailles matrix, you have pay reparations. You pay us X, billions, X amount of billions of dollars of Reichsmarks per year, or be subject to invasion, military occupation of your industrial zone, and compulsory payment taken out in the form of actual barter, actual dismantling of industrial plants and shipment back to France. And this, in fact, did happen in 1923 with the French occupation of the Ruhr Valley. They actually physically went in with military force, occupied the industrial heart of Germany, and compelled the Germans to make payment. Now, if you look at the ancient practice, what's sacrifice? Pay the tribute, pay the sacrifice, or be subject to military occupation, deportation oftentimes, look at the ancient Assyrians, or Make your sacrifice, make your animal sacrifice, your human sacrifice, and if you don't, you'll have bad crops if you don't make your sacrifice to the gods. Now, I want to stress something here that's very important. If you look at most of these ancient texts and traditions, 
sacrifice begins to rise, begins to become an acceptable practice after some sort of war. Okay? So with that in mind, let's look at something else. This little quotation is from the History and Mythology of the Aztecs, the Codex Timul Popoca, and is translated, as you can see, from the Nahuatl by John Beerhorst, and I've cited this in my book, Grid of the Gods, on page 208. Listen carefully. The Toltecs were engaged in battle at a place called Netlalpan, and when they had taken captives, human sacrifice also got started. Indeed, every kind of human sacrifice got started then. It was the devil's enemy who started them. Huemek sacrificed a human streamer, now listen carefully, thus making payment a reparation. So look what we have in just the Aztec tradition alone just as we have, incidentally, in the Western Christian tradition, the idea of a primordial war followed by the institution of a bloody sacrifice to maintain the broken order and stave off economic collapse or payment by payment of a debt. It's a tithe. It's a tribute. It's a way of symbolizing that you own the wealth and labor of an entire civilization because they are defeated in war. Now let's go one step further into the distant past and this idea of a cosmic war. Sacrifice is also viewed as an analog to dismemberment that you see in some cosmological and metaphysical processes of the differentiation that leads to creation. In the Vedic text, this whole process of differentiation that creates all the fullness of diversity that you and I know and experience in everyday life, this is described in the Vedic texts as dismemberment. And so in some cultures, this idea of sacrifice expresses itself how? Linda Howe has done uh, yeoman's work studying the phenomenon of cattle mutilations. And even in some cases, if I recall, Linda, you were talking on, on radio about human mutilation and what is this for? Well, as I've suggested and as Linda has suggested, this might be a component of the institution of some sort of reparations clause in some far distant cosmic treaty of Versailles. Okay? Oops. Now let's look at something else Versailles did in more detail and compare it to the ancient text. Let's look at the inventorying and destruction process. The Treaty of Versailles, for example, demanded that Germany turn over copies of its big road mobile 16, basically 17 inch siege guns, the so-called Big Berthas that they used in World War I, you know, firing a shell that weighed a ton. And that Germany also turn over, especially to the French, a copy of the Paris gun. If you don't know what the Paris gun was, the Paris gun was a gigantic cannon that the Germans used to shell Paris from over 70 miles away. And that may seem unrelated to the phenomenon of space, but we're going to talk a little bit more about it in a moment. The Germans refused to turn over a copy of the Paris gun to the Allies. In fact, they claimed that they had destroyed it completely and destroyed the plans. And in fact, they went further. They passed a law after World War I forbidding any German who knew anything about the gun or had worked on it, or maybe been part of its crew from talking about it to anyone. That was classified a top secret state secret. The Allies, for their part, carted off what weapons they could, studied them, number two, and made use of that technology 
from their former enemy in both military and other applications. This is sounding a bit like the epic of Ninurta. And number three, they destroyed or insisted that the Germans destroy as much of the really nasty stuff that they could and ordered the Germans not to build any more of it. And as I said, don't, uh, don't think you're going to get away with it because we're going to keep an eye on you. So in other words, don't build any more of these. And don't build any more of these. This, incidentally, is the Paris gun. This is the 17-inch Big Bertha. You can kind of see the scale of the thing. But look down here at the little man standing next to the Paris gun with a barrel so long that it had to be wired so the barrel wouldn't droop when the thing fired. Now, why did I put that in there? Because the projectiles from that weapon were the first man-made objects in lower outer space. It shot up into the stratosphere, and that's how it was able to achieve the long range. So the German space program really begins in World War I, and as Walter Bosley is going to talk to you uh, after my presentation, there are indicators even earlier than that that there's something going on in the world of black projects concerning space technology. But, oh, looky, looky. In World War II, gee, all of a sudden, the Germans are trotting out this thing, which had an incredible range of 100 miles, and, oh, looky, looky, um, gee, we, we may have found some of those old plans after all and maybe kind of updated them a bit. Um, <laughs> so, now, let's leave the Germans and go back to Mesopotamia and look closer at the Epic of Ninurta. Because this indicates that a similar, if not identical, pattern of the inventorying, the destruction, and then the secreting of technology is at work once again. Because in the Cosmic War, as I've indicated, I cite this at length. It's pages 222 to 227. You, the whole text is there. You can read it in all of its boring, detailed, blow-by-blow, -blow, Sears index, Sears catalog index glory. It's an inventory. It's a catalog. That's all it is. It's, it's about that exciting to read. And there's three classes of technology. Well, there's the stones from the Tablets of Destiny. That's what the Epic of Ninurta is talking about. The war, the cosmic war, was fought for and over the possession of technology of mass destruction. There are stones in these Tablets of Destiny to, preserved, to be preserved and carried off by the victors for use and study in other applications. It says so right in the text. There are stones that are ordered to be smashed and pulverized. Don't build any more big cannon. Okay? And then finally, most importantly, there are stones that cannot be destroyed. There's some component of this ancient technology of mass destruction, whatever it was, that could not be destroyed. And so it had to be hidden. And listen carefully to how this is described. It's right up here on, on the slide. LL is the name of this stone. And in the text, the stones are address, addressed directly, like you're talking to them. LL intelligently you caused terror of me to descend on the mountains. And let me stop there. Because the word akur in Akkadian, guess what? It can mean a mountain. And a mountain in these texts can symbolize a planet. And it's the same word that's their word for a pyramid. Okay? You caused the terror of me to descend on the mountains where discord had broken out. In the rebel lands, you proclaimed my name among my people who had banded together. Nothing of your wholeness shall be diminished. It shall be difficult to reduce your mass to small pieces. You shall be greatly suited 
to the clash of weapons. You shall be set up on a pedestal in my courtyard. In other words, it's being kept out of public view. This is one of the gods keeping this for himself. So in other words, the implication is that the LL stone, whatever this may have been, was a kind of philosopher's stone, if you will, of ancient high weapons technology. It's a kind of ultimate weapon. And because it can't be destroyed, it's hidden. Now, let's go further. The Versailles Treaty stipulated that Allied, and particularly French, military attaches, as I've indicated, would have access at any time unannounced to all German heavy industry and armaments plants for the purposes of monitoring compliance with the treaty. Think about the implications of that. Because additionally, this meant that the Allies, and particularly the French, and you can't blame them, put into place and expanded all of their on-the-ground human intelligence inside the German Reich to ensure that the treaty provisions were being complied with. And incidentally, the other part of the story, as I've indicated most recently in, in my book, um, The Third Way, Germany developed the policy of using, listen carefully, using its big international corporations as proxies for the development of hidden arms technology in foreign countries, not even on German soil. Okay? So there has to be a system in place to ensure treaty compliance. Now let's go back to some ancient texts. Ever heard of the Watchers? Now, this is the Slavonic text of the Books of Enoch. And this is the Oxford uh, translation. I have a copy of this. I photocopied the cover here. 1896. It's a difficult text to get a hold of if you want to read the Book of Enoch in a scholarly presentation with gobs of footnotes. This is the book I would recommend. But now listen to what it says. This is from chapter 18, uh, verses 1 through 3. The men took and brought me up into the fifth heaven. And by the way, what's that reference mean? St. Paul ascends to the seventh heaven. Fifth heaven. What's, what's all of this numbering of heaven? What does that really mean? And I saw there many hosts, not to be counted, called Grigori. And their appearance was like men. And their size was greater than that of the giants. In other words, to put it bluntly, they're talking about our genetic cousins. And their countenances were withered and their lips were always silent, unquote. In the footnote to this passage, the translators, Morphel and Charles, note that the Grigori is another name for the Watchers, that class of humanoid beings whose duty it was to watch and, if necessary, guide, that is to say, interfere with human affairs. Question. Why was it necessary for humanity to be watched and guided? And I submit that the answer may be that in the aftermath of a cosmic war, which incidentally, in my view, may have included the destruction of an entire planet, all of Star Wars, what, it's what you would do. You destroy the inventory and technology that made such a war and the destruction of an entire planet possible, number one, and number two, you'd prohibit the development of that technology again. And number three, you would muddle the science to prevent humanity from achieving that kind of technological prowess again and misapply it. And you try and mold and direct human affairs. 
you'd have, in other words, the ancient version of a covert operative or an agent provocateur trying to steer events and shape public opinion and socially engineer society by dint of those types of intelligence operations to prevent, it's a form of soft power, to prevent the recurrence of a war of that destruction again. And this is exactly, of course, the Versailles template. But then, the translators go on to state something else in their footnote. I live for footnotes, by the way. They state that, quote, the text cannot mean that all the watchers rebelled. In other words, whatever this war of the gods was, whatever this civil war in the ancient pantheon, like the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns and the Windsors and the Romanovs and the Savoys fighting each other, whatever this ancient war was, not all of the people in that category of ancient watchers or Grigori rebelled, but it was from that class that the rebels proceeded. So note the implication carefully. What you have now are two post-war, post-cosmic war elites. A good one, the victors, and a bad one. On or near planet Earth, watching and manipulating humanity. And again, World War I was, by any account, an unsuccessful war, because what did it leave in, in, to, in place in the defeated nations, especially Germany? Well, the Kaiser was gone, but that whole infrastructure, that whole German version of the deep state, the military class, the general staff, the industrialists, the big bankers, that whole class atop which the Kaiser sat was left in place. So the elite continued. And what the ancient text is telling us is exactly the same thing. The elites of both sides in this cosmic war continued. So they go on to state, it is, of course, just possible that the writer's scheme may differ from its conception above and be as follows, and listen carefully now. The rebellious watchers with their prince Satanael are confined to the fifth heaven. Again, what's this numbering of heaven? The subordinate angels who followed them are imprisoned in the second heaven. Whereas the watchers who went down to earth and sinned with women are imprisoned under the earth." Unquote. And this is from pages 20 to 22. It's the note on the fifth heaven in the Morphal Charles text of the Book of Enoch. What you have here, my friends, I, th I submit to you, is a quarantine zone. Somewhere out there in outer space, around planet Earth, and to some extent inclusive of planet Earth. It's a cosmic Versailles template. So what do we mean by the fifth heaven, by the second heaven, by the seventh heaven? Why these constant references? And again, the Versailles template is very helpful here. Because Morphal and Charles also go on to state in their footnotes that it was, quote, under, listen carefully, under the sphere Edom est within the orbit of the moon, which is the least under all, and is a firmament, and there the souls of the demons are. And note conversely that in pagan traditions, it's not the place that is reversed, but the moral status of the people within it that is reversed. Because for the Stoics, and even for an early Christian writer by the name of Tertullian, this within the orbit of the moon quarantine zone is the abode of the blessed. But you still have this conception of fifth heaven, seventh heaven, second heaven, under the sphere of the moon. So I want to 
peel the layers back and show you what's going on. Number one, we have a clear reference to a quarantine zone, which is defined by, secondly, a clearly defined astronomical and hence identifiable boundary, a natural boundary, defined by the orbits of the planets. Demilitarized the Rhineland. What did the Allies do at the Treaty of Versailles? They picked a clearly recognizable and more or less permanent geological feature on the topography of Western Europe and said, 50 miles beyond the east bank of this river must be completely demilitarized. That's the quarantine zone. Thirdly, note what else has happened. Because with the reference to the moon, a natural base of operations is created for anyone intent upon the long-term observation of humanity in planet Earth and its compliance with any possible maybe hypothesized cosmic Versailles treaty. And since the moon is ready to hand, number four, this might explain the sudden spike of UFO interest in and interference in human nuclear and thermonuclear weapons systems during and after World War II. And finally, there's clear indication that whatever the results of this cosmic war were in terms of interstellar politics or what have you, that the result clearly is, is that both parties to this conflict and their elites survived. So we're in a bit of a moral muddle. Did the good guys win? Did the bad guys win? Are we the bad guys? Are whoever's out there the bad guys? Or neither? Now, we're getting to the, to the crunch here. Because what might this mean for the national security state, for the establishment, as they're noticing these parallels, or possibly studying these parallels between modern human history and ancient texts? What are the implications for a secret space program? Well, number one, since we have some indications in some texts of a quarantine zone somewhere here in this solar system, in some versions of this quarantine zone, it's at the orbit of the moon. In some versions of the quarantine zone, it's at the outermost orbit of the then known planets, which would have been Saturn. Okay? There's a quarantine zone. This may indicate that human presence in or beyond that zone could be interpreted as an act of war or a violation of the stipulations of some lost cosmic Versailles. And this is my real point, folks. It's because of that one point alone that those in charge of the national security establishment are going to be going back and looking at these texts in the post-World War II world. And as we're going to see in a few slides, you'll recognize some of these men and recognize their role in World War I. And now, this brings us to the other idea. Fragments of that treaty and its provisions seem to be appearing in ancient texts. So as a safeguard to this idea, it'll be necessary to ensure that human presence in outer space is not misinterpreted. And I suspect that this may be the real reason that when we sent lunar probes first to the moon and then further out, sent probes out to the other planets, we made really darn sure that we put little placards and official notices on these things. Hey, we're coming in peace for all mankind. Who's the message addressed to? Why would they have suspected or insisted upon putting a message like that? Was it just to have a monument up there on the moon? Or was there another reason operative in placing these little notices on those early space probes? And what I'm suggesting is, of course, there was another reason for it. <laughs> 
Then secondly, Adolf Hitler, of course, in 1936, remilitarized the Rhineland. He said enough. In other words, what he did when he marched those German troops across the bridges there at Cologne, Germany, was he served notice then and there that Germany was unilaterally withdrawing from the, from the provisions of the treaty. So now let's look at the implications of what a cosmic Versailles might be, because as human international commerce becomes increasingly reliant upon space-based assets for financial clearing, stop and think of where we would be right now if we didn't have assets in outer space to conduct our transactions, or for that matter, our global positioning, our Google Maps, and so on and so forth. We're talking right now about increased space mining, mining of asteroids, mining the moon, mining Mars. This means, like it or not, folks, like it or not, that you have to have protection of those assets in order to conduct stable commerce. This means, like it or not, the militarization of space is coming. The real problem is, is that quarantine zone. Are we in a cosmic Versailles? This means that we will have to demonstrate, as I indicated last year, by some means, I call it kind of a space gunboat diplomacy, by humanity, to whomever, that humanity has acquired a rudimentary capability of engineering systems on a planetary and stellar scale and that we might have the potential to weaponize systems on those scales because you can't take anything for granted. If you fought a cosmic war in the midst of prehistory right here in the solar system, and if they're still out there, and if they're still watching, you know, lots of ifs, but this is, this is a, a game that you cannot get wrong. You must assume the worst case scenario. You must. That's why you put into place all of these secret black projects to ensure that the next time around, humanity will be able to defend itself against the interference from the gods or the demons or whatever. Those types of demonstrations, that type of space gun boat diplomacy, that type of, if you will, interstellar psychological operations, might be, therefore, intended to force a renegotiation of the tribute and sacrifice component of any cosmic Versailles that might have been put into place long ago, particularly since it will not be lost upon the technocrats and oligarchs of any such breakaway civilization or secret space program that with the advent of Christianity, and its influence over a significant part of the world, that the payments of sacrifice ceased completely. Why? Well, in Western Christian thinking, because Christ makes what? The perfect and infinite sacrifice. So that whole system goes. But that might have been a treaty violation, you see. So that renegotiation, let's think in more modern terms that renegotiation might have taken the form of commodities payments or of slaves. And by the same token, if that ancient treaty stipulated, well, we need so much sacrifice from you, symbolize it, you know, by offering your firstborn or whatever. It might mean that that whole sacrifice culture simply went underground. And I think if you stop and think of certain things in the news over the past few years, there's some suggestive evidence out there that that might indeed be the case. Finally, if you're dealing with a cosmic Versailles situation, then the clear implication are also, first of all, both sides survived. 
Secondly, and the question is, are they still around? And secondly, that the first stage of the conflict is over. And that means there's a possibility of a second one. And therefore, a renewal of it at some stage in the future. Could this be the reason that we've been reluctant to pursue the manned space program beyond the moon landings in the 1960s to extend that manned program into outer space, further away from Earth? Now, given that this Versailles template, as I'm calling it, dictates that not only some sort of quarantine zone was established or instituted in local celestial space around clearly defined astronomical boundaries under the sphere of the moon, and incidentally the expression under the earth, I think is an astronomical reference. It doesn't mean under your feet in the ground. I think it means under the plane of the ecliptic. Okay, it's another one of those astronomical boundaries. This implies that there was some sort of monitoring or espionage project put into place to monitor humanity to ensure compliance with those treaty provisions, especially, especially in the manner of tribute, sacrifice, and making darn sure that humanity is not going to develop these technologies. So in other words, there's yet another reason perhaps for the secrecy of these black research projects. They're not trying to keep it secret from us, but perhaps from someone else. Okay, and you know, we're all poker players here. Do you ever really show your whole card early on in the game? Mm -mm. Of course not. So this means something else. Any program of the technological emulation of UFOs must be accomplished, accompanied by a counter-espionage program to identify and mislead any watchers. Such a program would depend on a massive surveillance program. What do we got? And B, on the acquisition, listen, of a massive genome DNA database. Because remember what the text said? They look like us. They're just a lot bigger. A massive genome DNA database to identify those with non-human but humanoid genetic signatures, our genetic cousins, thinkancestry.com. And now one final curveball. In my book, The Cosmic War, I recount this war from a lot of different ancient texts, and there's something I, I began to notice about these ancient tablets of destinies, these ancient uh, technologies of, of mass destruction. I think they were biometrically activated. You had to have the right retina scan. You had to have the right DNA. Otherwise they wouldn't work. That's why only the gods could possess them. And if you suspect all that, and if you're invading a bunch of Middle Eastern countries to collect artifacts, and not just oil, you're going to start looking for it. And the only way to do that is through a massive surveillance program coupled with biometric databases. Guess what the FBI wants to do right now? Huh? Fifthly, since the ancient texts, particularly the Mesopotamian and Greek traditions, indicate that a cosmic war occurred in our own celestial neighborhood, what's Kronos in the Saturn? So in other words, the whole Greek mythology of the Gigantomathe, the, the war with the Titans, this is all interplanetary right here in local celestial space. <clears throat> 
if you interpret the text in that fashion. And you have a bunch of other characters. One of the most famous being, and you're probably going to hear about this character from Dr. Brandenburg, Nergal, otherwise known as, that's his Mesopotamian name. Akkadian name is Heracles, Hercules, Ares, Mars. Okay. This means that there might be remnants of the technology used to fight that previous war on those planets. So what's humanity going to do? Leave it there? Set up an international planetary, you know, historical site marker? Or go looking for it? So, while the public message placards on human space probes might indicate we come in peace for all mankind, the possibility exists that a covert purpose exists for the exploration of these bodies and for the recovery and analysis of some of these ancient technologies in our cosmic Versailles template. So final slide, if you've been counting the slides, this is the 33rd slide. <laughs> now, I believe, definitely, that it's evident from the behavior of the technocrats running this show, supposedly, and who are concerned with monitoring space and particularly UFO affairs, from the concern to secure human thermonuclear weapons systems against any outside interference, human or otherwise, and any space systems against UFO interference, to the indicators of the developments of hidden technologies and energy systems, you'll hear uh, I hope from, from Dr. LaViolette, if you don't know his, his books, folks, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion is, as far as I'm concerned, the textbook on the thinking and the technologies <clears throat> that are out there in the public record. To the development of a massive surveillance state. Look what we're living in now. Rapid on the spot. Why all of a sudden are we hearing about rapid on the spot DNA sequencing technologies? To the sending of messages on human space probes assuring whomever of our peaceful intentions. Yeah, when we marched across the island bridges, our, our intentions are entirely peaceful. Well, you know what the British response of the day was? Well, they're just marching back into their own country, after all. It becomes clear, in my opinion, that these patterns and these policies corroborate the possible existence of this Versailles model as a template for policymakers of the breakaway civilization and the National Security Group. And this template has indeed informed the behavior and influenced the policy-making culture of that group, especially as regards to the existence of a covert space exploration and rearmament program. After all, what did Germany do between the wars long before Hitler ever took power? German rearmament, my friends, was underway as early as 1923. Why? Simple. Germany is one of the great powers of Europe, in the center of Europe, to demand and insist that it completely be defenseless against any potential enemy simply wasn't going to fly. The Germans had to. So they had to make peace with the other pariah nation of the era, the Soviet Union. So who did they build the industrial plants for? Joseph Stalin. Where did their military officers train with the weapons that they were prohibited under the Treaty of Versailles? In Russia. With Russians that they would fight in World War II. I've always thought very ironic. Marshal Tukhachevsky, famous Soviet marshal, liquidated by Stalin, was a personal friend of the German Colonel General Heinz Guderian and these were the officers that squared off in 1941. So in other words, 
the infrastructure of rearmament was carried out by proxy nations out of German soil completely. And I think that's what these men that put into place this system did. And that's why it's being kept so secret. And indeed, it may not even be produced here on Earth. It may be being produced right under our feet. So that's it. Thank you. Gotcha. I can see Isley talking there. Don, turn your head to the right. There you go.